my specific area is behavioral neuroscience. So I'm kind of like a, a you know, sort of a half, I guess I'm kind of a hybrid, kind of, you know, part psychologist, part biologist, you know, dabble a little bit in, into chemistry, but not too much because that was not one of my favorite subjects. Um, but so my, what, what I'm interested in, since most psychologists are interested in behavior, cognition, why we do what we do, I'm interested in trying to identify brain areas, parts of the brain, neural mechanisms that are involved in these behaviors. If you're going to start messing around with the brain, uh, <laughs> most people tend to frown on, uh, you know, giving drugs to, to, to change these things or manipulating the brain. So we use rats who have brains remarkably similar to ours to, to a large extent. I mean, they've, their cortex is not that well developed. I mean, it's kind of much smaller, but, you know, they've got all the components that we have. Uh, in many ways, they behave the same way that we do. Um, when push comes to shove, they eat a lot of the same things we eat. That's why rats are always uh, around people. They've kind of followed humanity across the world and partly because they're so much like us. So we can understand a lot about human behavior by studying these little guys. What got me into this? Uh, partly default, partly just I thought it was interesting. Uh, when I was in college, I probably did what a lot of students now do as well, is that you, you try different things. And uh, some things worked, some things didn't work. And over the course of the four years, I realized I really liked the brain. I liked understand, you know, trying to understand how the brain works and uh, decided just to go to graduate school. Yeah, it was either you know, get a job in a steel mill or go to graduate school. And that wasn't a big, you know, hard choice. So <laughs> went to graduate school and uh, had a couple of very good advisors uh, in the, the two schools I went to, and it sort of took off from there. I really never looked back after, uh, since then. Well, what we're doing now, and this has probably been for the last couple of years, our big thing is uh, looking at the effects of fear on play behavior in young rats. And up, up until fairly recently, I guess last 10, 15 years, most psychologists studied fear by pairing up a tone with a shock. So you take a rat, you put him in a, in a, in a test chamber, and, and, and you hit him with a tone, you boop, and then you shock their feet. Well, after a while, they get scared when they hear the tone. It's a classical conditioning. But most rats in their daily lives don't run across a, a tones and shocks. It just doesn't happen out there. Uh, so a number of labs started using more innate stimuli. So things that animals would normally run across in their daily lives as they're foraging for food, trying to find a mate, trying to, you know, find their way around the world. And one of those is larger predators, and in particular cats. So what we do now is we, uh, we have several cats where they, uh, well, not in the lab, but, you know, pet cats. People have pets, and then I give them collars, and then they put the collars around their necks, and the cats wear the collars for about two months. And we take the collars off, cut them up into little snippets, and then when the rats smell the collar, never seen a cat before in their life, smell the collar, they're scared. They stop all behavior, they start doing other behaviors that, that are indicative of fear. And so we've been looking at that from a more of a childhood standpoint. Since I do young beha behavior in young rats, we do primarily play behavior. So we're interested in how do young animals deal with threats? How do young animals deal with situations that provoke anxiety, that make them feel anxious? And how can we modulate that a little bit? And uh, the fear thing came up just as an example in class. I thought, ah, oh, we'll try this. So we went home, got my cat, brushed a bunch of fur off the cat, and took it into class. And we were starting to talk about fear, and I put this fur in there. And the rats, they have four rats, and they're very friendly, very, you know, we had been tickling them the week before, getting them nice and happy. And then they went in and they smelled this fur, and all four of them, four of them, bolted, jumped out of the cage, ran through the, the classroom. Of course, students are screaming and laughing and both, and, 
It was, it was an incredible demonstration, and I had a, then I had a student who wanted to do that for her senior project, other students who wanted to pursue that, and that just sort of took off, and we just been doing that for, like I said, the last four or five years. Okay, well, students are involved in the day-to-day -day data collection. Uh, they're involved in the data analysis. A lot of times, most of the data we collect is presented at a meeting, uh, either a national, international, or regional meeting. So in many cases, if they're available to go, they will come along to the meeting as well. And then as far as the writing goes, they're involved to the extent of they'll give me their thoughts on what, what they think is happening. And uh, oftentimes, though, the writing, the actual writing occurs after they leave. And it's the time thing. It's, you know, this isn't something we can do in, say, a six-month period. I mean, we, we try to collect data in semester snippets. So we collect some one semester, another semester. We'll have a summer period where we collect a lot of data. But that or normally takes much longer than the lifespan of a student here. Um, and, but they, they know about it because I'll let them know that this is happening. I'll send them a draft if, if there's a draft available. Say, if you would like to make some comments, and they're just all like, like wow, this is really cool. <laughs> and, uh, and then when the paper is finally published, we'll send it off and give them a bunch of copies. They can give them to you know, mom, dad, grandparents. <laughs> I don't see myself as an author. You know, I'm, I'm not a writer. Uh, I'm, I, I, that's sort of the last stage of making sure that your work is out there and can influence other people. Uh, I don't have a set schedule because, uh, you know, it, everything is so busy that, that we, I fit it in when I can. Oftentimes it happens over breaks. Oftentimes it happens during little breaks in the semester, uh, sometimes in the evening at home at the dining room table or the kitchen table. I don't have an office at home because I live so close to campus that I can't really justify it. <laughs> so, but my office is, is just, you know, whenever I start to write a paper, what I'll do is bring out all of the background literature that's relevant and just sort of lay it out so it's there and just start pouring over it, pouring over it. And what I find is that often it just happens, that at some point it all just clicks. My main interest since I've started in graduate school really is, is not necessarily fear, but has been play and why kids play, why most mammals play, and, and, and the function that that has. And so I do think a little bit about how my work informs us about the human condition, mostly in terms of, you know, why do children play? And is this important? And this is actually a very important uh, issue now in schools as some schools start knocking out recess, which I think is a very bad idea. You know, kids need to play. They have to play. We don't know exactly what the function of play is, but we do know that if, if they don't play, that they don't, they don't grow up the same. It changes their, their brain, it changes their neural circuitry, changes their uh, the neurochemistry, does a lot of things to them that, we're not, that we don't have a good understanding of. But we think it's important. Uh, we wouldn't all, most mammals wouldn't play if it wasn't important. So when do I know that, it's, that we've collected enough data to send it out and to, to put it in print so that other people can read it? And it varies from study to study. There are some studies we've done where you do one study and you think this is it. Either it, it has enough information and, and you feel that it's a large enough contribution to make it worthwhile uh, putting it out for peer review, or it's a project that has taken enough investment of time and energy and resources that you feel you have to because you're, it's going to be another couple of years before you do the next step. So that's sort of where we're at right now. We've just collected these, these data. It took about two years, and it tells a story. It's always new, and, and you're always trying to answer questions that not as many people have, are looking at. So you're looking at an aspect of, of nature that is, is different than what other people see. And it gives you a whole different perspective on 
on how the world is put together, how people interact with one another, on I mean, a whole bunch of areas. And it's just, so it is, it's new every, every day. And that is the exciting part of it. And that's sort of why I keep doing it, because, you know, you stay young. You, you, you stay active, and it's, it's, not, it's the kind of experience you can't get in other, in other uh, occupations.